Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hilary Woodhead and I'm the Executive Director of NAPA, the National Activity Providers Association. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to our second in a series of Tea Tuesday events with my very good friend, Danuta Lipinska. Um, Danuta is a specialist in ageing, dementia, well-being. Um, she has written a fantastic book, which we'll talk a bit more about later, and she's an international speaker. So, hello, Danuta. Hello, Hilary. Thank you for inviting me to tea this afternoon. It's lovely to see you. Lovely to have you here. Now, uh, Danuta, we've known each other a long time, about 20 yeah. years. And during that time, you know, I've been very aware of your work in the dementia care field, in counselling services for people with dementia, and your interest in, in sex and well-being. And we've had many a conversation about sex over those <laughs> years, um, which has been lovely, a real eye-opener for me. Um, and I just wonder, really, even before we met, probably 20 years before we met, I know you were developing these interests, and in, in, particularly in terms of sex and well-being. And I just wonder, what's changed in 40 years? You know, why now for the book? Well, we're having this conversation, for one, which is fantastic. Um, we've also learned huge amounts about uh, dementia and how it affects the brain and behaviour, including sexuality sure. and intimacy. Yeah. And we've learned a lot about older people who are cognitively well and the thing is that they're and some people into their second or third careers um, mm -hmm. older people who now have the the most disposable income that they've ever had um, who have the most opportunity for fitness and wellness in later life and we we hear about their life their life now and the things that are important to them including their sexuality so we've, we've learned a lot. And I, of course, have hopped across the aisle to the other side of the, the age <laughs> scenario. And I'm one of, the, one of those older people now myself. So partly I think um, writing the book for myself <laughs> um, in the future, but also like the first book, the counseling book, writing because um, clients said, please let others know that this is an important part of our lives still. Um, and you know, our, our tendency is to think about people with a dementia um, who may be in their 80s and, and living in a care home. And that, of course, still requires us to be thinking about their sexuality. But there are many older men and women and indeed younger people living with a dementia who are at home in their own communities. Um, perhaps they're single, perhaps they're used to a very um, a different way of living around their sexuality, that we need to be really open and willing to invite conversations of real worth in terms of how do we support each other. Absolutely. And I think when we were chatting and obviously we'd, we'd thought, for, we've, we've wanted for a long time, I think, haven't we, to have a, a national debate like this about this topic. But because, you know, we were coming from it very much from a, a, the point of view of well-being, of well we had to call this session Sex is an Activity too. And, um, you know, to, to, to make sure that actually we really are thinking about it as an essential part of somebody's well-being, as important as Sally says in your afterward, as baking and bingo, um, really, really important. So, you know, what, what do you think are the necessary skills, really, that activity professionals, that care teams need to be able to start to think about integrating conversations or making sure that they are responding appropriately to this yeah. particular area? Yeah. Well, I think first I'd just like to say that I've come across such excellent uh, care and interventions, fantastic conversations, um, people who are doing a fantastic job um, doing this already. Um, and so we know that, that there is good, good practice, really good practice yes. uh, around the globe. And I know yeah. that we, we may have some people joining us from other places with their cup of tea or maybe their first, their first morning cup of tea. <laughs> and we're in the afternoon here. Yeah. Um, but really thinking about um, the... Uh, the opportunity to have the conversation. You may be you know, listening to us now thinking, oh, this is the last thing that I want to do is have a conversation with somebody about their sexuality. Um, yeah. And so I think the place that we start to equip is with ourselves, you know, taking the time to have that conversation with ourselves, maybe writing, maybe journaling, maybe just um, having time to think reflectively um, about our own sexual histories, our own sexual experiences, our values, what we bring to our relationships with our clients or our patients, um, thinking about um, what I can do to clear the way, if you like, to, to reduce perhaps some of my stereotypes, to reduce yeah. some of 
the which is that I have learned through my own um, up, up, upbringing in my own family circle um, through my own sexual experiences and identities um, and beginning beginning with that and at the end of each chapter of the book by the way I, I say for us to uh, think about what we're imagining um, without judgment and with mindful appreciation and mindful um, acceptance of what our journey has been so far and if we do that and we begin with ourselves then we can perhaps extend that to the other person with whom we want to have the conversation yeah really good place to start isn't it it's always a good place to start starting with ourselves um, I think sometimes particularly you know in the work that I've done over the years and the work we've done together in terms of providing training you know I think that often particularly in care settings sex is a topic that's discussed when it's a problem um, and you know if it's if it's a problem then there may be risks associated with it there may be safeguarding issues associated with it rather than you know being an essential part of well-being and I just wonder you know why why do you think that is why why do we kind of we think of it as a difficulty a problem to be solved as opposed to something that actually we we should be asking about proactively and trying to meet the needs around proactively because you know like the other taboo death it's something that as humans we don't take too easily in terms of having the conversations and certainly when we're supposed supporting men and women many of them who may be older than ourselves the you know the imagined needing to be respectful of you mustn't yeah. ask older people these questions that it's too private it's too personal and yet you know in health and social care we get very good at asking questions about people's bowel function, their bank account. <laughs> Don't <laughs> um, we just, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But we very rarely talk about their sexuality. I remember yeah. seeing one um, admission form in, the, in a care home and the little box that said sexuality, someone had filled in, where's lipstick? And I thought, you know, what a, a missed opportunity. They might well wear lipstick and that might be identity, but what a missed opportunity. Yeah, yeah <laughs> really absolutely. important to uh, to acknowledge that this is something that is usually very private, um, not very dissimilar to people's political persuasions or their religious or spiritual identities and affiliations. Mm -hmm. People will say, mm -hmm. "I don't really want to talk about that; it's private." Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, it reminds me of um, you know, I'm showing my age now, but I was absolutely obsessed and in love with Boy George when I was about 12, 13 years old. Had a poster on my on my bedroom wall, you know, absolutely, and wanted to be Boy George. And I just remember reading an article that said, that asked him about his sexuality, and everybody was quite intrigued about his sexuality at the time. I remember, and he said, "Sex? I'd rather have a cup of tea." Now, of course, we know a lot more about George, about Boy George now as time's moved on. But I just wonder, you know, it's not, it's, it, it's, this isn't, is this for everybody, this conversation? Is it, is sex a do you think? I think the conversation can be for everybody. Be willing to acknowledge that some people would much rather have a bowl of popcorn and a box set of Killing Eve yeah. <laughs> than having yeah. to think about, about sex. And of course it is, it is a fluid thing, you know, the ebb and flow with where we are in our lives, you know, what's happening, how much privacy do we have, you know, things like, you know, four generation households and certainly most recently, um, yeah. everybody living, you know, very, in very close quarters, um, mm -hmm. the opportunity and, and thinking about sex may be the last thing on anybody's mind. But having said that, um, is um, to stress, distress, um, feeling pressured, uh, feeling anxious, and feeling bored is yeah. is sex. Um, yeah. And so, you know, in a situation where an older person perhaps is finding their lives very much changed, and maybe not uh, with a partner that they've had for a long time, mm -hmm. um, they may be finding out new things about themselves in terms of how can they experience you know sexual release through orgasm which of course reduces stress right away um, uh, it also you know increases appetite increases the ability for a good night's sleep reduces blood pressure um, and a whole host of other things apart from just the the obvious yeah. um, so it's it's a it's a very big topic and of course you know you and i've only got exactly exactly and i suppose you know part of this is is it's about embarrassment, isn't it? You know, how do we overcome embarrassment? 
And, you know, you talk in your book about having person-centered conversations about a unique model. Would you tell us a bit more about what you mean by that? How that yeah. kind of relates to this topic? Theme? Yes, <laughs> yeah. So um, without wanting to just go into full lecture mode, <laughs> yeah. um, just trying to keep it conversational. But um, <laughs> I think one of the things, of course, in terms of, you know, beginning with the self um, and having that conversation, with what feels comfortable. Um, it reminded me very much of you know, the person-centered work that Tom Kitwood hopped onto, which was originally Carl Rogers talking about you know, the core conditions for a therapeutic or a helpful, um, um, a, a healing and helpful relationship uh, would be those three core conditions that many in, of us in the health and social care realm know very well. And that is looking at acceptance or the non-judgmental way of approaching um, congruence, which is being genuine and authentic and, and reliable in our relationship. And of course, um, extending empathy, which is being alongside that person or being in that other person's shoes. And if we begin with that in ourselves, being accepting, um, being authentic and genuine and engaging empathy around us, that's where we do our first bit of homework. Yeah. And then we engage with having the conversation. So um, yeah. I think I'm right in yeah. imagining that most of us, you know, in this room would be thinking that it's important to have this conversation at, mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I said to me, and here's how you do it. Here's yeah. how you have the conversation. Yeah. So then I thought, well, what do we all know about and what are we using already as a model um, to help us to engage with what's happening to the person that we're supporting? whether that person is an older person uh, who's healthy, whether that person is someone with a dementia or someone with a disability, because we certainly know that people living with a Down syndrome diagnosis develop um, Alzheimer's disease, particularly in their 50s. And we want to be looking at the Human Rights Act alongside um, the Disabilities Act in terms of how we can support people in both areas, for sure. So yeah. when we think about Tom Kitwood, and what we now know as his flower, the visual that he gave us to help us remember, and boy, does it help us remember, yeah. Yeah. those aspects of the psychological needs of people living with a dementia, for example. And so if we begin with the first place is comfort. You know, what is comfortable to me in terms of having this conversation? You know, in, including even the environment, where are we sitting? Are we having a cup of tea? Where are we having the conversation? How comfortable am I? How comfortable is the other person? And certainly being in that environment of what is, is the maximum comfort that we can have brings us to think about all the rest of those five aspects as well. And so when we think about, you know, what might be happening in the real world, you know, let's say, for example, you know, Bill is in the care home and Bill is now going to, to try and, and hop into bed with people, you know, at the care home. And someone might be thinking that this is a sexual event and we've got to make sure that this and that and the other, all of which is true. Yeah. But actually at home, Bill sleeps naked next to George with two cats and a dog. Yeah. And oftentimes a blankie and, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. a cup of coffee. And so what is Bill actually in search of? You know, it's yeah. finding comfort is not necessarily the same thing as looking for a sexual experience but sometimes it could be. Yeah. So thinking about Kitwood's model, it would be um, looking at comfort, identity, inclusion, attachment and occupation, and using those as the template for asking the questions around sexuality. So it's so difficult to imagine coming out of the clear blue sky and having a conversation yeah. Yeah. about sexuality with someone, but here we've already got a tried and tested template yeah. that can help introduce us into the conversations in ways that give us objectivity rather than my opinion or my values getting in the way of having that open conversation. Does that make sense, Hill? It makes absolute sense. And, it's, and also it's straightforward. As you know, it's something we know and, and we have practice already that we can, that, that's tried and tested, that we know works in terms of, you know, the Kitwood model. Um, it makes complete sense. And I wonder if then part of that needs to, there needs to be maybe added in a period of reflection, you know, for the, for the staff member too. But, you know, what happens after you've had that conversation yeah. with somebody? You know, how does that, what do you do with yeah. that information? But also what do you do with you after you've had that, after you've had that conversation? It's really important, I would have thought as well. Yes, 
Absolutely. And there might be someone who's realizing that I've left love out of the center of the flower, you know, in the middle of Kitwood's how flower. Could, how could you? <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I did that is because we need to consider that people will have sex without love. Um, when you have sex with love and affection, woohoo, that's, you know, fantastic. Um, but human beings are able to engage in sexual activity alone or with others that doesn't necessarily include our idea of affection and or romantic love. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Thank, Thank you for that. To say that. Thank you for that. And I just want to acknowledge that we've got obviously people here from all over the world. So welcome to, to colleagues from Brazil and New Zealand and Australia and America and Canada. So this is very exciting. Please ask your questions in the chat and uh, we will do what we can to fit them in um, over the next few minutes or so. Um, I don't think we can talk about this topic, Danuta, without kind of acknowledging the last few months, really, and the devastation that, that many of our colleagues working in care homes have experienced and the devastation that their, you know, the, the people that they support have experienced. And I wonder if there's anything that, that you know, we can, we can do to try to compensate in some ways, but also just to make sure that we don't miss that need for kind of touch. That may, that, that may be lost, as well as kind of the physical presence of, of somebody that you care about or that you love or that you're sexually attracted to. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I've been amazed by the NAPA membership and, and all the wonderful things they've done to, to make or enable people to remain connected. But I, I do worry about the physical, the physical touch and the, and the presence of, of, of the people that matter, really. Yeah. Um, yes. any, any thoughts about that or any observations, really, in terms yes. of your, your practice? Yeah, well, I think all of us um, have a, a, a broad, much broader and deeper sense of what it might be like when the opportunity in terms of making the connections and looking out for our own needs, including you know, physicality of, of touch, sexual and non-sexual, we have a greater depth of understanding and awareness, I think now, of um, women and men who are living with cognitive change and behavioral change yeah. and many who have been perhaps living um, in communities where they are now having to spend a lot of time by themselves in isolation and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a huge amount that's been missing for all of us and for those men and women in particular, um, especially those who were used to having a sense of intimate connection with their lover, with their partner, um, perhaps really missing that but also yes. the possibility that as we know that expression you know if you don't use it you lose it um that when there are dry periods in life when you're not having sexual relationships or even um self-pleasuring for whatever reason um or have chosen celibacy you know as a as a way of life for a period of time in your life um you might actually run out of the need or the zest or the energy to be thinking about or engaging in sex um, and so we don't know for sure how this is affecting people living with a dementia who are living in community, but it may have an effect on their lover or their partner, their husband, wife, whoever might be coming to visit, having spent a long time really missing that person and missing the closeness, mm -hmm. missing the intimacy and arriving to find that maybe Bill or, or, or Judy doesn't actually really feel that way about them at the moment. Um, and so it may be a, an opportunity for getting to know people again, yeah. to support them in not only just perhaps meeting in the garden, you know, under the gazebo, but now meeting in uh, the, the lounge. And then later on, they might be meeting again in a, a private space where they can have some personal time and some intimacy, but not making that faster than it needs to go. Yeah. Really yeah. taking our cue from the individual in terms of, again, their level of, of comfort with what's happening for them yeah. and being as supporters of we, as we can by um, making ourselves available to have those conversations. Yeah, and that's, that's key, isn't it, is actually if we're, if we're available, then we're more likely to be asked how we, can, how we can make a difference. But if we're not available, if it's something that we're not tuned into ourselves, then it's less likely that we're going to be asked how to make how to make this happen or how can I feel more comfortable in this situation um, yes, yes. I think that's a really important point I think something um just to I'd be quite interested to kind of hear your views on really I mean it's it's just coming in now really interesting um a, a question here from Emma can Danuta say something about capacity and decision making 
in relation to engaging in intimate relationships with other residents where no partner remains. Mm. Any thoughts on that one? That's from Emma Hewitt, Hewitt from Four Seasons Healthcare. Well, there, there, there are lots of different ways to answer that question. And of course, you know, with an international audience, you know, everybody needs to pay attention to their own local uh, policies and procedures and guidelines. Okay. But I think yeah. in terms of, of human, the Human Rights Act, um, you know, in terms of, 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 the, of the articles that relate to our, the right for us to have relationships and so on, we need to be thinking about this from the perspective of human rights and also being very clear with regard to the law, <clears throat> excuse me, which in the UK yeah. at least, um, describes very clearly that if both people are lacking in capacity, then intimate sexual activity isn't able to take place. Um, yeah. And so <clears throat> there are things that then have to be thought about and considered in terms of how do we then support someone who may and not being able to. So yeah. if people have capacity, then the number of combinations for um, connecting with other individuals in intimate ways is as, as endless as the individuals themselves. And every person has to respond to the unique situation of that woman and man in that uh, particular scenario. So mm -hmm. the first and foremost is for people to be safe um, and for vulnerable individuals who are unable to make decisions by themselves to mm -hmm. have others to keep them safe from, um, from vulnerable uh, situations. Uh, but having said that, we know that capacity is um, specific to a situation and fluctuates with time and with the, the, yeah. how the person is in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so just because that person may have a dementia or another cognitive or a difficulty or a disability doesn't define that they therefore cannot be making a, a, an informed consent yeah. around them in that particular time. Yeah, brilliant question, Emma. Thank you, Danuta, for that. I mean, I think it is something that we know causes concern, doesn't it, for staff? Yeah, because they want to, you know, and they're often trying to, you know, uh, manage the expectations of family, visitors, families and friends of a person that's so supporting. Um, and Emma, of course, said where no partner exists or remains, but what if the partner does remain? Um, and, you know, all of the, all of the complications that, that that can bring. Um, and one of the things that's always bothered me, and maybe, you know, this is uh, probably says more about me than others, but is the public discussion, the scrutiny that we sometimes um, you know give to these situations that we have to have a sit down and talk about it with lots of people in a room and you know everybody needs to know about it including you know i'd be mortified if i thought my you know my, my children were involved in discussions about my my my, my sex life um so Absolutely. you know that's, i think there's something there as well isn't there about the need to know and who needs to know and who needs yeah. to be involved yes. in discussions um where there's an element of risk or there is an issue of capacity I don't know yes. if in your experience, I know that you touched on it in your book, but in your experience, if there's anything there in terms of a case example that you could share with us. Um, well, not off the top of my head. I'm trying not to uh, have much of a, a lecture format, but I, I think that, <laughs> but I think that it's something that, that needs per, you know, attention in the, in the moment. And yeah. you're absolutely right. You know, who is it that needs to know this information? Um, and when we come back to that place of comfort, imagining how comfortable would this resident or client or patient be um, if they thought that their whole extended family or their, their adult children or yeah. you know, several people in the, in the health and social care team knew um, what was happening to them and what their thoughts and feelings were. Mm. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that if the person lacks capacity, that therefore it goes without saying that there now needs to be a, a conference, let's say, with everyone around a table, as you described, Hill, exactly. um, having that conversation. And yeah. it may be, you know, some of the intimacy that we, we hear about from residents and from patients and so on occurs during those sensitive times when we're supporting them with personal care, when we're yeah. perhaps giving them a massage or a back yeah. rub. Um, and that conversation may be specifically for that one person in the room at that time absolutely yeah and so because i think that's that's really important and i think the more conversations that we have earlier 
rather than at the point of this being a potential difficult issue or problem or risk or, or potential safeguarding concern if we have the conversation earlier on yeah. then hopefully we'll know what the person who the person would like to yeah. be included in, in certain discussions about their well-being whatever aspects of that their well-being that might that might include later on um, as their exactly. needs change yeah. and i really like you know, saying about in the moment you know there are certain intimate moments aren't there where you might you might find yourself as you say engaged in providing personal care for somebody or sitting you know watching a sunset with somebody or whatever it might be and you're having that special moment and it's then when the person feels able to talk about and it's or it's the right time for you to ask about yes, um, yes, this yes. particular aspect of somebody's life and you know if those opportunities are missed they might not come again so I think, you know, having the confidence sometimes, isn't it, to, yes, to, yes. to, to go with that moment, go with the flow and ask those questions or yeah, uh, yeah. enable the person to, to have a good, you know, to have a, a, a to talk about it, or have a cry or whatever it might be that just, re, you know, enables them to express that yes, uh, yes. with somebody, think, another individual. Yeah, and you asked earlier, you know, how can we, how can we prepare? I think having um, practice runs, um, you know, having... Um, uh, situations like an, an as if experience, talking with your staff, if some, someone might say such and such, if you discover so and so, what are your thoughts? What are your responses? How might you do that differently? So yeah. before the situation arises where it becomes station, if we know that sexuality is part of, of many adults' life experience, not everyone, you know, we might start the conversation at the point of admission to the day center or the program or the clinic or the, the care home or the yeah. ward, whatever that might be, the counseling session, um, you know, the opportunity to talk about this has been a big part of your life. We know that um, when someone is living with cognitive change, let's say, um, that this aspect of living is going to be very different. What would you want us to do um, in terms of your, your dad or your partner or your adult son? Um, if this was the case, how do you want us to relate their concerns around sexuality? What do yeah. you want from us? How can we support you with your sexual self? Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And we've just had a, another question that's come in. Um, it says, what can care settings do to give more positive messages that they welcome um, lesbian, gay, bi and trans people and their relationships? Mm, that's a great one. Um, and we've got a wonderful new republication of Sally Knocker's fabulous book. Um, Just this week, hot off the press, Danuta. Basically me, yes, hot, hot off the press indeed. Um, it's around, around the UK for sure. I'm not so sure about the rest of the world, but I'm, I'm sure that's the case. In terms of wanting to explore and be open to and encouraging and welcoming of a whole range of different sexual identities and um, experiences. Um, and I have to say, I'm, I'm not sure about some of them. I don't know how I would feel if everybody was wearing a lanyard, you know, that said, you know, we welcome L LGBTQ plus in our home or rainbows, um, you know, ex 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 on the desk or on the or windows or whatever. But I think for me, it's much more about people being open and people being warm and welcoming um, and giving, giving uh, the conversation, having the conversation, which is about we welcome everyone here and being able to, to talk about the numbers of, of different human elements and different experiences that people have that are welcome and yeah. that we want to make sure that people feel um, that they are able to, um, to approach any of the staff, that they feel that they're able to have a conversation that's about them but it may be because the staff member initiates that conversation first. Mm, yeah, maybe. And I think also it's something about how you, how we promote what we do in terms of, you know, the images that we put out, in terms of the language that we use when we are, you know, selling our products, when we're promoting our services and our organisations, you know, how inclusive are we really and really looking at yes, that yes. And, and making sure that we are consulting and collaborating with the people that may well be using those services, either now or in the yeah. future, you That's know, what feel inclusive for you and asking that, and asking that question. Um, yes. I think, again, it comes back to the conversations, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. being authentic, you know, with being authentic with your experience that what you're saying actually is a reflection of who you are as the person. Yeah, 
Absolutely. We've got a comment rather than a question from, from Mike Phillips. He says, wearing a rainbow lanyard is a good signal as long as the person wearing one is able to fully accept, be accepting of people who are LGBT. And I think you're absolutely, I think that's a great point, Mike, actually, you know, it's all, we can all wear the t-shirt, can't we, and wear the lanyard, but actually it's about much more than that. It's about absolutely yeah, yeah. our approach yeah, yeah. and, and, and um, you know, our, our values, really. Yeah. And being being able to, to be genuine can also mean <clears throat> saying things like, you know what, this is all new for me. You know, I didn't grow up talking about sex in my house. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe you can help me along with this. I yeah. really want to, to know and really appreciate you and understand your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so yeah. being able to, to be that authentic of, I don't know all the answers. I don't, I don't yeah. have the answers. You know, this is such a, a unique experience for each person. Yeah, um, yeah. that we, we really do have to do this with great sensitivity and it can be done with great heart and humour. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a, another comment that's come in. Um, health and social care in NI, so Northern Ireland, have developed an operational protocol. Sorry, I'm just needing to do the... Not very good at this. Regarding sexual relationships um, that dementia specialists and sexual health specialists will take forward. So fantastic. That sounds really like nice. the lovely Seamus Macaline. Um, and the documents are terrific. I really highly recommend them. And if uh, we have them in our resource pack, Hillary, that would be terrific. Yeah. But they really are very thorough. And the case examples are excellent. So thank you for that, Seamus and the team over there in Northern Ireland. Fantastic. Good. And I think, you know, we, we, we went on the kind of... Um, you know, being inclusive, thinking about how we do things in a way that actually really is inclusive and making sure that we're getting that right or we're working towards getting that right. Um, Natalie Ravenscroft, who uh, works for Belong, Village Care Villages, she says, we hold safe events that are open to all from laughing yoga to transgender beauty evenings. My making, by making the groups mixed and not focused, that starts the conversation but it's important not just to help staff and it's important to help staff understand the issues. And I think that's, again, thank you. Yes, absolutely. So a great example of an activity, which is inclusive, but also yes, that, yes. you know, you've got to start with the staff. Yes. yes. And, and prepare the staff appropriately. Lovely. Okay. So I think how we do, we're, we're doing well for time, but I just wanted to kind of ask you really, you know, about, any, any particular words of wisdom or any advice that you would give, you know, as a parting kind of comment from today's conversation, Danuta, what would you like to leave us with? Is this the, the parting comment, Hill? Yeah. <laughs> and the parting comment, I think, is that we're all told that love makes the world go round um, and sex will add some sparkle along the way. Fantastic. Now, I do want that on a T-shirt. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. And just as Danita said, we've got, we're putting together a, a, a small, otherwise it could go on and on, but just some ideas, some resources, a small list for you, which we will send out um, to everybody that registered. If you're here by proxy, because somebody else has shared the link with you, or because you, you know, just happen to be sitting alongside a colleague, let us know, send us a, a message, and we will make sure we get those resources to you as well. Um, in the meantime, the book, the name of the book, we did have a, somebody say the name of the book again, please. Dementia, Sex and Wellbeing, a person-centered guide for people with dementia, their partners, caregivers and professionals. Um, and it has a fantastic forward by Caroline Baker and a fantastic afterward by Sally Knocker. So very, very, very great reading. Great, it was my weekend's reading. I loved every minute of it. Thank you so much, Danita. I need to get out more. You need to get out more, Hilary. <laughs> well, it's a good time to catch up. But I've read a lot of books over the last few months. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and if you want to know more about Danuta generally, you can go to Danuta's website, which is just danutalipinska.com. So very easy to remember. And obviously there are lots of resources, as you all know, free resources on the NAPA website. And also if you have any questions about engagement, please ring our helpline, our free helpline. The number is 0800 158 5503. So please keep in touch with us. And as I said, we will, we will send you all just some resources and some references to the, to the book and some of the other articles that Danuta has found helpful. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Danuta. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye-bye.